Good evening. Good evening, Jamie. Good evening. Um, I just want to thank everybody again for the opportunity. Um, I get always a little nervous. I'm not nervous when I go to school and I preach usually because they can just give me a bad grade. But if I, if I mess up here, I have to suffer the eternal mockery of my family. So, <laughs> it's a little bit more nerve wracking. But if I go ahead and turn to Philippians 121. Philippians 121. My mom loves Hallmark movies. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a Hallmark movie. I love to make fun of Hallmark movies, so it's a good combination. But she's happy because Beth's here, and she also loves Hallmark movies. So they've been watching uh, When Calls the Heart, and there's a lot of makeup in that. I wasn't a fan, but um, you ever been watching a movie like that, or a Disney movie, or anything that's put out by Hollywood? A lot of times the main character, if I can talk, the main character will have a crisis and they, they ask, what is life for? Why am I alive? What does life mean? And I think that's a pretty fair question. People want to know what they're living for. You know, in the movie, the culture will say, it's the American dream. You know, the, find the car and the white picket fence. Or others will say, it's just about to make you happy and about finding love and, you know, true happiness in your heart. Some even say, you know, they go to the far side of life doesn't mean anything. Just get what you can out of it, then move away, and you just pass into nothingness. But people, deep down, I think they know that life is more than that. I looked up some statistics, and almost 7% 7 American, 7 of Americans suffer from major depression. And that's depression that is life-altering, they can't function. So that's not counting all the depression that people feel day-to-day -day going in and out of their jobs. And I would argue that probably most people have suffered from depression at least once in their lives. Suicide rates rose 24% from 1999 to 2014. What this says to me is that people know something's wrong. There's something missing, there's a blank there. That happiness and true love and all this, it can't replace it. We Christians have the answer, but so often it goes to waste from our testimony and from our own lives. Read with me the passage in 1.21. I'm going to start in verse 12, actually. And Paul says to the Philippians, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all the other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and of also goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affection to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. But what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached, and I there do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know this, that shall turn my prayer salvation through your prayer, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness and all ways, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be my, my life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul explains in this passage that his life has no meaning. It's nothing. It's outside of Christ. The phrase to live is Christ and to die is gain, I think we use that so many times to, to encourage us in, in going into hard things. You know, when we talk about missionaries going to the jungle, to die is gain. And we focus on this die is gain, to die is to be with Christ. But I want to focus today on to live is Christ. I just want to share a few thoughts today and see a few examples about how our lives can have meaning in Christ. I want to first off start with Paul. You know, you want to, you want to talk about a man that went through trials and tribulations, you want to talk about Paul. You know, stoned, beaten, almost to death, abandoned, betrayed by his own people. The very people that he once helped with in killing Christians turned against him and started pursuing him to kill him. And yet... He made all these missionary journeys, and he wrote all these letters to churches, and he impacted so many lives. How did somebody that was so beset by trials that you would think would incapacitate a man, how did he stay strong? Turn to Job 1.13. Another man you think of trials that would seemingly be ineffectual and pointless is Job. And it goes to, to explain in the first part of chapter 1 here that God and Satan have a discussion about Job, and God gives Satan permission to afflict Job. And in verse 13 through 20, Job 
loses his whole family, almost besides his wife. All of his sons and daughters are killed. And only a few servants are left to come back. And this one after another, his family members are taken away from him. In verse 20 it says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came, out, came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know anything about parenthood yet, but I would imagine that if all my children were taken away from me and died in the space of a few hours, that might not be the first thing I do. Is to worship God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How do you do that? How does somebody focus on that in a time of such tribulation? You know, in times in my life, I, you know, I get a bad grade in a test and I can barely worship the Lord. How do we turn our lives into focus on some things so much better? What about somebody like Nehemiah? Nehemiah was the man that led Israel back into Jerusalem to rebuild the wall after captivity. And he was beset on all sides as well. By his own people, probably in his own camp, that were lazy, that didn't want to do this anymore, that wanted to go back. People outside the camp that attacked him, that they had to build with the shield and the sword in one hand and the tools in the other hand. How did he stay focused on his task? Another two people I think about are Elijah and Elisha, prophets that have the word of God. And they knew this was important for the people of Israel to hear, but yet the people of Israel pushed them away. And King Ahab and Queen Jezebel tried to kill them. Had them set out on a bounty and one of them murdered. How do these people stay close to God like that? How do they all continue in their tasks? What connects each one of these men's stories? The connections in these stories is that they realized that their story wasn't about them. Each knew that whatever happened to them, they would continue on because it didn't matter what happened to them. Their life was for the Lord. I think so many times when we look at trials and tribulations in our life, we look, how does this affect me? You know, we've talked about deaths in the family and losing of loved ones, and it's such a hard thing. But so many times when that happens, or an illness comes up, or something happens where our lives are interrupted, our minds immediately go to, how does this affect me? And this is not where our mind should go at all. Our mind should go to, where does this further the gospel of Jesus Christ? Where does this further the plan of the Lord? What has God planned for my life? This is not about where I want to go, but where God wants me to go. So how do we stay strong in this? And this is when the TV preacher tells you that God is only concerned with your happiness. And you just need to maintain a positive outlook, you know. Everything will turn out all right. We know it's not going to be all right. We know that things are hard. You know, you just have to talk to some people. You go outside and talk to people for 10 minutes, you know, and you realize that everybody's got a multitude of problems. This isn't, life isn't about maintaining a positive attitude, and, and God will give you everything you want. We must stay focused on the fact that my life isn't about me, but about Christ. Please turn to Mark 10 real quick. This is a familiar story. And I got confused at first, if I'm honest, because I was looking for the passage and I was looking for the, uh, the story of the Virginia ruler, and it actually never really says that in here. That's just the name of the game, which is a weird aside on that. But Mark 10, 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him, Jesus, and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go to thy way, Sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Um, the rich young ruler goes away, then obviously uh, Jesus preaches the uh, dangers of riches and going into the kingdom of heaven. But if you look over at verse 28, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. 
Now, is Jesus saying that that, uh, that family and things and possessions and things like that aren't important, that they, you have to abandon them to be, to be saved? No. But he's saying that those things are not your focus anymore. If you go into the world and a good person would say that I'm working for my family, I'm working for to get a better promotion, to get more things, just like Mr. Lon was talking about this morning, they're not content with things, they want more, they're working for these things. But God says, as a Christian, this is no longer what you're working for. What you're working for is me and my furtherance of my gospel. What convicts my heart so many times is how focused I am on what I want, what I supposedly need. Anybody that knows me knows that music is a huge part of my life. It's one of those things that I can't even put into words, you know, the feelings it gives me when I hear, you know, a, a good song, a good strings quartet, you know, one of the songs that are sung in church. It, it brings my soul up. But if I was to go deaf tomorrow and never hear a note of music again, how would I react? Because that music's not for me. It makes me feel good. Sometimes I use it for my own pleasure, which I probably shouldn't. That music's for the Lord. Everything that I do is, is toward Him. When I was in a, my senior year of high school, I was playing a soccer game and it was getting pretty intense, slippery, and I ran out to grab a ball. I was a bully, and a guy slid into my leg and, and broke both of my bones in my lower leg. And uh, it took a long time to heal and stuff like that. And so when I came back, I jumped back into the basketball court. And the first game I started in my basketball senior career, I uh, dislocated my thumb. And um, I've always enjoyed athletics and, and being able to run around and do sports and soccer. I, so I don't enjoy to run. But if I'm running for the ball, that's okay. I can do that. <laughs> but, um, I've always enjoyed that. And I've never been able to, to do that at the same level or rate. I've, I've never been very good at it. But, you know, being able to run out there for hours on end without any pains in my leg or anything like that, I've not been able to do that. I've had to slow down. And for... A long time, if I'm honest, that made me a little bitter, you know, like, it doesn't make any sense. Why would God, you know, take this, oh, I'm having fun playing sports. Why would he have this taken away from me where I have to take a break every 20 minutes, you know, and go stretch my knee out? It seems ridiculous. But those, when I was studying for the message I was going to preach, I got convicted, you know, I was like, that leg's not for you. That leg's not so you can go out and play soccer and have a good time. That's a blessing I've given you, and I still have it, honestly, but that leg's for furthering my gospel now that you're a Christian. I think we would do well to learn from the story of the rich young ruler and of Jesus' disciples in this, that everything must be left behind. Not that you get rid of your family, but that that's not what it's about anymore. If God will have it, he will have it. And it's for the furtherance of his gospel. So what are ways that we can have to follow the correct perspective, to keep our lives focused on the right way that we can find joy of the Lord? Well, there's many ways that my dad correctly preaches in the pulpit all the time. And the, same, the first part is follow the parts of God will that you know. And how do we know that? It's in the Bible. Oftentimes, you know, when we, when we speak of God's will, we get this idea, this nebulous, you know, confusing thing. You know, God's will, what is it? You know, will he open and close doors for me? Where will I go? That's not the important part of God's will. The important part of God's will is what's in his word. And if we do that, we'll know it. The rest of it is. It'll fall into place. And that's what I've learned. The more I'm in this word, the more that as I follow and I encounter things in my life, I'm like, well, the Bible says this. I should just do this. And it comes into place. The second part is to stay focused in prayer to Him and for Him. You know, a lot of times as we pray, even if it's subconscious, we pray for things that will make us happy. And God wants us to be happy. He wants us to have joy in Him. But that's not the focus of what we're doing. The focus of what we're doing is to further His glory. And so when we pray, what are we focusing on? Are we focusing on the, the new, you know, my health? You know, I, do I, am I praying just so I can feel better in the morning? Or am I praying that I feel better that I can go out and I can spread His word? Am I praying that I can feel better so that in the morning I go to work and I can be ready to spread the gospel among my coworkers? The last thing I would say um, to help us keep focused is to give. Because the times that I give the most are the times I discover I receive the most. 
and I feel the most blessed. If I don't focus on my own issues and my own problems, and I instead focus on helping others and bringing them to Christ, usually my problems kind of go away. There's a program at school called Christian Service, and it's the same where every weekend or every week, you know, whatever it is in the week, a group of young people go out and they have a Bible club or have a nursing home ministry or something like that. And it's an opportunity to serve in our neighborhoods. And I've noticed the weeks or the couple weeks that I've missed Christian service and I just do my own thing, I get into like a funk, you know, and I just kind of wall around school and, you know, grades and I got to study and that, you know. It's just, you're depressed a little bit. But when you go out and you give some of yourself, you don't have time to be depressed usually because you're thinking about the things that you're doing. And so in conclusion, I want to say in Colossians, go ahead and turn to Colossians 3.23. But I just want to re-emphasize the fact that our lives are not about ourselves, but about God and His will. My depression and my anxiety can fall away when my life isn't about me. Colossians 3.23 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Remember, your life isn't for yourself in this new year. Your resolutions aren't for yourself and for your own pleasure. They're for God. May we go into this new year focused on bringing glory to God instead of living for self. Thank you.